everyone, Greg Meskel here. Thanks for joining us. Finishing off a great week of at home with USA Water Polo. This week's theme has all been about return to play. And as we've said before, all of our talks this week, just a reminder that we know that depending on where you are in the country, you're at different versions or stages or phases. Some of you we know are back in the pool. We've seen the photos, passing, swimming, uh, doing socially distant workouts. Others are still waiting for your facilities to open. Uh, we know that's a tough time as you're really, really wanting to get back in the pool. We hope that happens uh, for you very soon. And keep in mind, uh, it depends on where you live. So uh, your facility managers, your health officials, those are the folks that are going to be advising when places in your areas can reopen. Um, so, so make sure you check in with those uh, people in your area to know when you can be getting back in the pool. Today, we have the great pleasure, thanks to our good friends at Hogue Orthopedic Institute, to be joined by uh, Dr. Gazanaga. Doctor, thanks for joining us here today. Uh, we've, we've had a great talk with many of your colleagues throughout the week. Appreciate you being here. If you kind of just tell us a little bit about uh, the medicine that you work in and what your connection is to water polo. So I specialize in uh, sports trauma type of um, surgery, really. So uh, that covers a lot of different things. It could be, you know, sore backs, necks, shoulder injuries, elbow injuries. Um, and uh, I do hips, hip, uh, hip surgery, knee ligament replacement, shoulder reconstruction. So it goes all around the body. And um, I kind of gravitated towards uh, sports, um, having been a, a former athlete um, decades and decades ago. Um, and, uh, but I get, uh, I get my, um, sort of satisfaction, uh, occupational satisfaction from getting athletes to reach their maximum potential. And, uh, so that's sort of what I do. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, and, and as far as the sport of water polo, any, any close, close tire connection there folks you know about? Well, there's a couple of people I know, uh, so I grew up uh, here in Orange County and I uh, went to Foothill High School. So uh, my sister swam for SoCal Aquatics. And, uh, and so I was very, um, I was friends with a lot of guys on the water polo team, but because I uh, was a, a natural born sinker rather than swimmer, I decided to play a different sport. Uh, but uh, we went to, uh, Moved back to California from after being on the East Coast for almost 25 years doing my training. And um, we started uh, getting into athletics for our kids. And uh, we started over at um, at uh, the, the YMCA in, uh, in Costa Mesa doing splash ball. And that evolved into water polo. And then that evolved into, I have two daughters currently playing water polo. One uh, will be moving on to UCLA next year. And the other one will be a sophomore at uh, Orange Lutheran High School. Excellent. And as we're talking, I can already uh, picture the amount of times I've mispronounced your daughter's names uh, during highlights in the past. So uh, good to have well, you ever, to hear if this. You, if you ever <laughs> did, my wife would have corrected you already. <laughs> hey, so then may, maybe maybe I got it right. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of kids playing water polo. But really appreciate you being here and kind of lending your expertise to kind of dive in first to kind of the COVID part of this discussion. And we're going to talk about, about that and a little bit about uh, your area of expertise and kind of injury prevention and that sort of thing. But people, depending on where they are in the country, are getting different um, guidelines. They can get back in the pool. They can't. People want to be safe. I know it's very broad, but assuming you're following all of these protocols, is it is it safe to get back into the pool? I think this is a big question we get. Like, even though I want to follow all the rules. Am I being safe to start playing again? Yeah. I think um, uh, ultimately th this is, this is a question that's much more difficult to answer than it should be. Um, and I don't want to uh, be part of anything that has any kind of political flair to it, but it definitely um, is confusing and conflicting and difficult to find out what the truth is. If, um, if things seem to be so cluttered up in, in um, hearsay and opinion. So if we were to try to look at the science, <clears throat> even the science is confusing because the scientists are unsure. But if you look at uh, this virus, which is a coronavirus, the coronavirus is um, a common virus. It's, it, it can cause the common cold, uh, but it also can cause this SARS, this um, you know, respiratory uh, syndrome. 
And the issue is that for the most part, what we understand about it is that it's very transmittable um, through droplets. So th therefore, the masks being important so that you don't have this direct contact of droplets from one person to another and you have the distancing so it decreases the chances of that happening so the, when you look at the cdc guidelines they they um don't want uh, a lot of people gathering in in smaller locations so unfortunately a pool deck is a relatively confined space and if you have um, a bunch of people trying to swim at the same time then that increases the risk you can't swim with a mask on, so that is another factor in terms of uh, the CDC coming up with um, risky places to, um, to spend your time. But the reality is once you're in the water, so first of all, being outside is safer than being inside. The other is um, being in the water is relatively safe. What we know about the virus is that it doesn't survive very well uh, just open um, in the water. And uh, the temperature, the water itself, and the, even the chlorine um, is very detrimental to the virus. So for the most part, if you're swimming in one lane and someone's swimming in another lane, it'd be nearly impossible for uh, coronavirus to transmit from one person to the other. <clears throat> you get out of the pool, you start talking about your swim sets, all that sort of stuff. That's when, that's when you're gonna run into problems. So uh, if you have access to uh, a swimming pool, either, personal or um, anything that's a community pool, if you protect yourself uh, by distance and mask and you uh, swim at a safe distance, then it's incredibly safe to do that. You mentioned the chlorine and I think when this was all starting, a lot of water polo folks uh, and, and you know full well a couple that have been in some chlorinated pools and mm -hmm. when, you, when you come out of one of those, you feel like that yeah. body of water must have killed anything that could have been alive uh, outside of the people that were swimming in it. And there was a hope that, well, okay, great, we're good. Chlorine is gonna wipe this out, so we're fine. But to your point, it is all those other things that go into being at a pool that leaves you still a bit susceptible. Exactly. The pool, the chlorine itself has been shown, uh, it's been um, written in literature and the scientific literature and examined it and it shows that uh, the chlorine definitely uh, has a very rapid uh, effect on the virus to to kill it and to render it, you know, non-infectious. You talked a bit about some of the things that people hear about often, mask, social distancing, six feet apart. Anything else athletes, coaches, people should be keeping in mind as far as preventative measures when they know they're going to go into one of these uh, aquatic facility type situations or they're going to have a practice of some kind, even, even with limited spacing, Anything else we should be thinking about, perhaps before, during, after? You know, the a lot of um, a lot of the protection for this virus is going to be down to come down to logistics. So, if you have uh, four teams showing up to a pool at the same time and each takes a little corner of the pool, that's going to be much more vulnerable to transmission than if each team had their own dedicated time to show up to the pool, and you section off the pool so there's enough space uh, among the players. The issue obviously is uh, water polo, uh, you know, is one of the more close contact type of sports that you can possibly play. So um, that's gonna make practicing it very difficult. But if, if you're practicing uh, shooting and positioning and uh, those sort of things, it's much more uh, safe and less likely to have a problem. So. It really comes down to planning, logistics, uh, having people be patient with uh, their, their pool time, how that's allotted to different teams. Uh, obviously doing dry land stuff as much as you can to, to try to avoid close contact with others. That's, that's really how it's gonna work out. Talking with Dr. Gazaniga here from Hogue Orthopedic Institute. If you have any questions, comments, feel free if you're watching live on Facebook now to uh, throw them in the comments and we can work on addressing those questions. And of course, this interview will be available on demand on the USA Water Polo Facebook page come next week as well. You mm -hmm. talked earlier, and, and this was a point, I think every, every doctor we talked to this week hit on a similar topic, the, the importance of the mass, the importance of six feet apart, but also, look, no one wants to make this a political issue right there in agreement with you, but give a little background for how these consensus decisions come about in the medical community. So 
This time around, it's masks, right? But four years ago, something different, whether it's the use of a certain medicine or some other procedure that maybe goes on to fix an injury, isn't this how a lot of these decisions come about? There is, there's data, there's research, there's reading, and then kind of the medical community coalesces around a common opinion on how to handle something, yes? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, again, to try to avoid making any political statements, each, uh, each political side, uh, however many you want to divide them up into, um, will have, uh, use the term science. And uh, as if science had some perfect uh, way of um, moving through a process of making decisions. The scientific process by, by, its, by its definition really is a process of uh, learning and adapting and changing over time. So if you have an assumption uh, you create a hypothesis, you test that, uh, and then see the results and the outcomes as a result of that. So, you know, in this uh, particular case, uh, use the coronavirus, um, you know, there was a lot of attention. Where did it come from? Turns out that that's not nearly as important as how we respond to it. So um, that's one all instant political problem that started is that, okay, who cares where it came from? Let's figure out how to take care of it and how to um, keep ourselves safe. But the, the result is that uh, initially, you know, you don't need to wear masks, uh, and then that's changed over time. You, do, you should wear masks. It seems like there's some, you know, major controversy about why that, um, why that changed over time. And, and it's, there's way more um, speculation than there is truth in terms of um, those sort of situations. So even the CDC or the World Health Organization, they, they're making comments based on their best information and not with a political agenda. They change that over time because they can see that things are changing and, and people are testing and uh, running experiments and looking at clinical data. And uh, so while it's, while it's frustrating and confusing, it's, it's every bit as frustrating and confusing for the people trying to create those consensus uh, uh, reports and ideas of how everyone should handle it. So, like I said before, it takes it takes a lot of patience, but you have to understand that you know nobody's looking for um, you know Armageddon in the world. It's it's just a, a process of of um, you know finding the best solution over time. We had a question come in off of one of your uh, last thoughts about uh, perhaps doing more dry land workouts than more pool activity. And I'm, and I'm guessing that was in relation to the close proximity of water polo in the pool, not just being in the pool in general, as opposed to yeah. dry land or, or, or what's your, what's your well, thought? Well, I mean, I, I have my thoughts. I mean, uh, I, I, I struggle probably more than anything else in my practice with overuse injuries. So, um, you know, you take a, a gymnast, a baseball player, a swimmer, uh, and they're going to be 12 months out of the year trying to do their uh, craft. And if, um, if someone starts to break down in doing one particular uh, activity, then changing the way they do it and being intelligent about modifying workouts and training hard in one direction and uh, making it overlap into another direction, that's where uh, creativity can take place. And, and certainly there's some people who seem like they can swim all day long and never have any problems. Other people um, aren't built that way. And so if you have one formula for every single person, it's going to have problems. My comment actually though, was more to the fact of logistics where if you have uh, a bunch of teams that wanna use the pool and um, your team is not one of those that are scheduled to be in the pool, it doesn't mean that you sit at home and wait for your pool time to come up. It means you go out with your team, either in a field or uh, in some other situation, even in a classroom or on a Zoom meeting like this to go over strategy to, you can still go over positioning, you can go over uh, concepts, uh, you can still train your body. I mean, you know, what water polo player wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, you know, want to have strong legs and a strong core. So there's certainly uh, great ways to work on that outside of the pool. So that's sort of where my comment was coming from. Well, it's a great, it's a great lead into another question that we just got. And it was something I was going to ask you about later on anyway, from the Southwest Florida Water Polo Foundation. But talking about 
Uh, how do you prevent some of the injuries that might develop from athletes who have been a bit dormant and are now trying to ramp up quick? So they have an egg beater in the pool in 12 weeks, and now they're back to it and they're feeling hip or knee issues, those sorts of things. Any ways uh, to kind of avoid, manage those type of injuries? So uh, in the NFL, I take care of an NFL team, and uh, they uh, have this data that they've been gathering on soft tissue injuries, and it's become apparent that the ramp-up time for, uh, for return to uh, full-speed activities is crucial in terms of avoiding soft tissue injury. So I've had some patients that I've seen today and they said, you know, I had this tendon problem and then I was quarantined for three months and I went back to doing my activity and it still hurt. Well, you, you haven't really done anything to take care of the tendon problem if it's just been sitting there. While it's true, a tendon can heal over time. It, it, a tendon has a property that's called viscoelastic. And if you don't challenge that in some way, it doesn't have the, the signals and the, the sort of uh, process that it takes for it to heal. Um, and so when your muscles have been dormant for a while and your tendons have been dormant for a while and you instantly try to get back to your previous level of activity, even for teenagers, believe it or not, um, it, it, um, it takes a ramp up period that um, you have to be aware of and you have to um, work your way through and anticipate that it would take two weeks of slowly building yourself up to being where you could challenge yourself um, cardiovascularly. So as you're, as you're exercising, your muscles and your ligaments and your joints, they can move along and they can become ready to do the exercise. And then it's about building conditioning to your heart and lungs to have stamina. So those are, that's sort of a process of growing through that. We, we talked about a couple of maybe smaller injuries that might crop up, but in general in water polo, whether it's, you know, post quarantine or just in regular times, what are some of the more common injuries that, that are seen in water polo players? And I'm thinking for some of the younger athletes that thankfully maybe haven't had an injury, but now they might know what to look for in, in that overuse category or just in a general injury. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting. I see a lot of kids that, um, they come in and they'll have, um, for instance, uh, pain in the front of their knee. Um, if you're familiar with Osgood Schlatters, it's typical for volleyball or basketball players or runners. Um, but it's really just a tendon overload at its attachment site onto the tibia. So the same thing sort of happens for swimmers or polo players where, um, particularly for polo players that have to swim and then throw and then shoot and then swim and throw and shoot and, and those sort of things. Um, where the tendon attaches onto the bone will constantly be pulling against it. And as kids are growing, the, the, the body is trying to get bigger. At the same time, you're adding more and more strain to these tendons and ligaments. And so um, it's wise in particular for parents to pay attention to their kids at that rapid growth phase. So below puberty, kids rarely get hurt. You know, they can probably, you know, they just seem to never get tired, unfortunately. But, uh, but uh, I've been through that phase already. But uh, then you start to get into puberty and you see these boys and girls, they start to grow more rapidly. Uh, and you have to be careful in that situation because that's when the growth plates and really the attachment sites of the tendons are very vulnerable to injury. Um, there's a lot of met metabolism that's going on right at those junctions. And uh, so when a kid starts to say, you know, I have shoulder pain or I have elbow pain, that is that is not uh, to be dismissed as just being, um, you know, part of training. You know, when you're um, past puberty and your late teens and early 20s and you have pain, it may be something that's um, like a tendonitis or that, that you need to sort of modify and work around. But as a kid, those are potential uh, injuries that would require surgery and, um, and you know, uh, time missed from playing. You were talking earlier about working with professional football players, and I know at the very high levels of sport, there can sometimes be kind of an old school feeling of like stay out of the training room because that'll be a red flag that you're not ready to go. You're not, you're not tough enough to play. You were talking just before about not overlooking injuries. How do water polo players, whether you're on that younger side or even into the college age and beyond, kind of toe that line between pl playing through some maybe tolerable pain or just working back into shape, which might cause pain, 
versus really knowing I'm hurt and I need attention. Yeah, you know, it's, it's um, having been an athlete and had pain and, uh, and played through it and found out that, you know, maybe it, it shouldn't have, you know, that sort of thing. Um, the, the reality is that there are people that complain a lot and they ruin it for those who don't complain a lot. Uh, and that's just the truth of what happens. You know, they're, the reality of having some athletes that um, every little bump and bruise they, they see someone for, and, and then it becomes Peter and the wolf type of story where, you know, it's hard to know which one is the real injury. But if you have, um, if you have some uh, soreness and you can, you can feel it dissipating over time, then, um, then that's just part of the sport and part of things that happen. If you have an abrupt injury, where you got hit and uh, there's a bruise and, and that dissipates over the course of a few days. That's obviously something that's, but um, the, the idea that you need to, even though you're having pain, you need to play through it is um, it's not easy even for sports doctors and uh, athletic trainers, but there has to be uh, knowledge of that injury so that it can be monitored over time. So if you don't tell somebody and then three weeks later, you say, you know, my shoulder's really killing me. Now I can't play. Whereas if they told someone three weeks earlier, they could have been conditioning it and they would have been better off that three weeks down the road. So um, I know there's nothing more frustrating for athletic trainers. What's more frustrating than someone who complains too much is someone who doesn't tell them about injuries. So, um, you know, if, if, if you're complaining too much, uh, a good athletic trainer will usually let you know. But but the, uh, but the reality is um, I would encourage people uh, to explore their injuries earlier uh, with a qualified person, whether it's um, their pediatrician, their um, family doctor, a sports doctor, and certainly the athletic trainers should be utilized as quickly as possible. Um, the athletic trainer is going to be able to tell you whether or not, you know, you need to take time off from playing. Uh, and then there's always going to be the situation that we run into where, you know, there's a big game coming up and I'm not going to tell anybody because I want to play in that big game. And, and uh, you know, if you do that and you're 21, 22 years old, well, then that's your choice to, to make that decision. But if you're responsible for someone who is, um, is a youth, then it's your responsibility to protect them and keep them safe. So you have to, you have to pay attention to those things, I guess. We're talking earlier this week and even yesterday with Dr. Uh, Elmo Agatef, who works with the women's national team for Team USA, about this idea of personal responsibility and health. And it was uh, more in that conversation tied to all of the COVID stuff, right? You wear your mask, that's your personal responsibility for you and others. But it sounds like it extends to, to your own responsibility about your injuries, as you're kind of describing, reporting those things early, listening to your body, and having a truthful assessment about how you feel. Not only that, um, it, it's, that, that's exactly right, but it also happens after you've been treated. So you've had surgery uh, and there's a specific rehab um, program and protocol that you're trying to follow. And let's say the doctor says, well, I don't want you to swim for two months after the surgery or three months after the surgery. And you say, well, my body heals faster than most people. So at two weeks, I'm going to try to swim so those are, those are decisions that um, are made that can be detrimental and either set you back or how, make you have to start over from scratch. So I would strongly encourage um, to have some trust in the process, uh, but no matter what happens, no matter what the injury is and how it's treated, there's a certain amount of biology that takes, has to take place. There's not, there's not a shortcut to a lot of different things. And, um, and so that's when the, the work has to go into it and the time uh, spent and the patience and the, and the faith that you're going to get to the, to the spot where you want to be. We're talking here with Dr. Gazaniga from Hogue Orthopedic Institute. This is the last day of our five days of return to play as part of at home with USA Water Polo. We've talked, doctor, a lot about the physical side of things. Mental side of it is huge. I'm sure you see it often, whether it's a confidence thing, a doubt thing, people working their way back from injury. But now with this quarantine, we're seeing it too, people doubting their abilities to kind of get back to where they were after being out for 12, 13 weeks. What are some good ways athletes can kind of handle that side of things? 
Well, in terms of uh, the mental aspect, um, the, you can rest assured that, um, that everybody's been in the same situation. So um, it's not a situation like um, if you, you yourself have been out of the sport and, and not, not able to play, then um, there's a certain amount of confidence that you need to rebuild. And uh, some people are, you know, so confident in their ability, it doesn't seem to affect them as much. Other people need to go through the process of building up their confidence as well as their body. But from the COVID situation, um, there's been a sort of a, a leveling of the playing field across, um, across everybody because no one's had access to pools and no one's had access. You know, my daughters who play water polo, they work out in the garage. So, um, you know, do they have an advantage over someone who's been sitting on the couch for three months? Yeah, that's, but that was their, uh, their obstacle to overcome. And that's how they decided to take, take care of that problem. But if you look at, um, if you look at the, the mental aspect and trying to, and to be a great athlete, it comes down to a, a choice and, uh, and you have to make the choice that you're going to move forward. And, you know, not everybody's going to be the greatest player uh, out there, but if, if you're doing it um, in large part out of uh, passion for the sport, then uh, you focus your attention on the love of the sport and less so on the results. And, uh, and that, that's, I think that really helps to get people through it. It's, it's uh, you know, it'd be great to, to have everyone tell you that you're the best player of all time, but, but um, if, if you're doing it for that, then you're gonna ultimately, there's only one person who's not gonna be disappointed with the results and that's gonna be the best person. But, but um, I, I just encourage kids that you play the sport for the love of the sport, not for, not for some you know, grand prize at the end. We talked a bit earlier about kind of the ramping up off of sitting out, you're out 12, 13 weeks, whatever you want to call it, three months. And, and you talked about, you know, kind of maybe that two week period as you're kind of, you know, getting, getting back into where you're at in, in general times in water polo, right? So, so outside of this kind of odd, odd pandemic window, we hear teams talk a lot about kind of an activation, right? Getting loose, getting warmed up. Um, maybe the idea of like prehab to avoid injuries. Anything that kind of comes to mind, water polo specific, athletes could do to kind of make sure that they're uh, doing the best they can to avoid injury with some of those uh, overuse things you hit on earlier? Yeah, you know, um, in, in some way, shape, or form, um, you have to uh, prepare your body for exercise. Um, there's uh, sort of the concept of static stretch where you just stretch your muscles uh, there's an idea of uh, creating an increase in your heart rate. Um, essentially, both of them um, are designed to increase your overall blood flow in terms of the muscles and how they perform. So if you um, decided to do just static stretching, then you would have to do it to the capacity that um, your muscles would be, have enough blood flow to do your exercise. You could... Uh, in essence, you could run and do push-ups uh, and, and get a similar sort of result that you would get from just static stre stretching in theory. So for me, I, I, never, uh, I never seem to fall 100% in one direction or the other. And I, I think that um, the most effective way is to uh, do something to get your blood flow going, whether it's jumping jacks or jogging around the pool or doing something, then do some static stretching, then get in the pool and do some uh, low intensity uh, type of uh, water related activities, whether it's uh, swimming or egg beatering or just um, passing to warm up to get the blood flowing and then get into sort of um, uh, more dynamic activities. So if you were to just say, all right, everyone in the pool, we're gonna warm up with, you know, uh, know several 200s and uh, we're going to see how and then after that we're going to go into practice that probably is more detrimental to the um to the the shoulders and the, and the um the muscles of the athletes than it would be to go through that process of warming up but i i think in this modern day and age nobody nobody just jumps in the pool and says just start swimming unless you're <laughs> 
Hopefully and, not. Uh, if they're watching this, uh, please change your ways. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, old school. <laughs> Uh, this, is, this has been great stuff, Doctor. Really appreciate it. As we kind of wrap things up, I've been asking everyone this week, uh, kind of your FAQ. You know, what's, what's the thing you feel you get asked all the time that might be helpful to our audience here? And, and it feels like you probably covered a lot of that stuff as you've kind of gone over it. But two kind of columns that can fall in one as it relates to, um, you know, your specialization. And then others, since we're talking about COVID nonstop, you know, and you kind of hit on the mask and the social distancing. But but anything in those two areas that you feel like you're getting hit up about lately in the last couple of months that you're, you could kind of share with us? Did you say legally? Uh, late, lately. Lately. I was going to say legally. I'm going to, I'm going to pass on that one, but yeah, I'm going to try and keep you out of hot water here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think if I could get on a soapbox for anything um, and so this isn't a frequently asked question, but um, I think it should be. Um, in the world of loving uh, water polo and, and playing water polo and being part of a club team that's successful, uh, for me, you know, your kids uh, that are playing sports to try to play more than one sport uh, or to take a season off is really not just an opinion. It, it's, it's actually proven fact that if you were to take your kid and take them out of uh, swimming, so I'm talking about probably up until about high school. So uh, you take them out of water polo and you have them play other sport, not even swimming, and uh, do that for three or four months out of the year. They will not only be better athletes at the end. So uh, a water polo player that plays basketball, for instance. So you take the winner off to play basketball and uh, still you'll be able to come back and get on a club team for JOs and um, – but their legs will be stronger. They'll understand the dynamics of uh, motion and offense and defense. Um, they will have saved their shoulders as they are going through this growth phase. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a, a ton of, um, you know, club coaches that are turning their computers off right now and uh, <laughs> walking away, <laughs> slamming down. But, uh, but the reality is that, um, if you look at the long-term success of athletes, um, having played multiple sports, not overlapping the sports where you're playing them both at the same time, but, but taking four months a year off away from your sport is, uh, is probably the best thing you can do. If you look at Major League Baseball pitchers, uh, they, when they are done with their season, they stop, they don't throw to get ready for the next season. They take a few months off to really recover and let things heal up. Um, and then they get back into it and they're very careful about ramping up because that's their money maker. And if you can't, uh, if you can't keep that healthy, then, uh, you're done. So for, you know, labrum tears in the shoulder, uh, rotator cuff tendonitis, uh, hip labrum problems, um, knee meniscus injuries, all these sort of things that can happen to water polo players by overdoing it, um, just playing a different sport for a little while and you'll you'll be better in the long run yeah to paraphrase that old line right if you love someone let them go to another sport and if they come back it was meant to be right and that's what can happen with uh so many youth sports and you talk to a lot of water polo olympians almost every single one of them to your point up until high school played something else at a fairly high level they were they were very good at basketball and water polo very good at soccer and basketball and water polo and then to make a choice Oh, water polo is where I want to go as I got older. But um, across the board, uh, you you hear that, and it's it's good to hear you say it as well. Um, Dr. Zaniger, really appreciate you taking the time here with us. Thanks for sharing all your advice and thoughts. All right. My pleasure. Thanks so much.